Okay, who wants to go first? Got a guy right here. Like I was telling somebody earlier. Oh, Greg, I was telling all right, Greg. I, all right, I don't know who wants to answer this, but uh, whenever, Greg, you were talking about the grasshoppers and the high sugar content in the grass, and the grasshoppers weren't hey, compatible. That, that was me. What about army worms? What, what correlation would somebody have to, to, to deter that without chemicals? Army worms? Army worms. All right, so army worms, our country, lots and lots of army worms, okay? And this year was really, really bad. There were, there were people all through the deep south just absolutely eat up with army worms. Uh, all of our neighbors all around us on our Alabama farm, even on our Mississippi farm, were just absolutely eat up. Many of our neighbors sprayed multiple times for army worms. We never sprayed once. Okay, and we almost never have a problem with them, but here's why. It goes back to what Russ said when he talked about the plant bricks, B-R-I-X, the plant bricks. Uh, but our, our bricks levels are typically pretty high. They're in the mid-teens up into the 20s. So, so it's really two strategies that we utilize here that keep us from having an issue with army worms or any other pest. Okay. Uh, but one is the higher the bricks in a plant, then the higher the sugar content. The guts of these animals, like Russ was talking about, they can't process that, so that ferments in their gut and it kills them. They know that, so they instinctively avoid high, even if it's the exact same plant. If it's low bricks, and what I'm talking about here, bricks of under 10, then they'll go eat the heck out of that plant because the sugars are not enough to impact that pest, that army worm or whatever it is. But if those bri if that bricks level is 12% or higher, they will not touch that plant. They'll leave it alone. The, the other thing is plant species diversity. We have, as I said, 140 plus different plant species out there now and still growing every year. And when you have much higher diversity, you have virtually no problem with these pests. Where, where we see the vast majority of these are in low diversity and monoculture type situations. Russ? Uh, up in our area, the army worm has attacked a lot of farms. And like Alan says, we, we don't see it. I see a few army worms here and there scattered across the farm, but they're not a problem. So, army worms. Yeah, we were, or I was on a farm in Georgia here a couple years ago, and a guy uh, had a whole farm that he had renovated, and he'd sprayed it, and very simple uh, plant community out there, a Max Q fescue, and it was beautiful. I mean, it, Cows look good, and he had that stuff up about like that. It was in the fall time, and he goes, what do you think, Greg? I'm like, well, I guess I see an issue. I said, it looks to me like a wreck. And he, boy, he's kind of stepping. What are you talking about? I've got rid of my Kentucky 31. Life is good. And uh, he spent $50,000 renovating that 500 acres. And the next spring, late spring, the army worms came in, just wiped him out. One plant, that's all he had after. If he'd had clover, if he'd had anything else mixed in there with it, maybe some Kentucky 31 even, <laughs> um, they wouldn't have wiped him out. So plant diversity, grazing a little bit taller, having, don't have any bare ground. Uh, Greg, do you want to add anything to that? The other thing is if it's more mature grass, they, they don't eat it as well. They'll stop. I've seen them stop at a fence line when it's a little you've maintained a residual and it's not all vegetative to the ground um yeah and then goose grass if you're scouting it go to goose grass they love goose grass i used to think goose grass was a terrible grass but it's actually cattle like it real well too and it's a sign of compaction when you see that goose grass it usually grows in a road Uh, so for those of us who have like a small farm, we're talking 50 acres or less. I have a 41 acre farm in Newport. 
what is a good path or resource for someone like me or other small farmers that we've worked our land, we've got our grasses, we've, we're doing our rotational grazing. How do we move our cattle? How do I make my small farm profitable with just cattle? With just cattle? How do I make my small farm profitable with just cattle? First of all, you've got to have a good perimeter fence. You want to keep them home. I would look at my perimeter. Too many people get in the livestock business today and they don't have fence. I mean, newbies especially. They think, well, they, and you know, they'll get on and watch a YouTube video of possibly even me out there moving a wire, just one poly. Well, heck, Greg does it with one poly wire. We'll get in the cattle business. No, you get a good perimeter fence. That's number one. Number two, get some water out there. Get some water points. And you can overdevelop water. You can have way too many points, but you need to have some out there. And then I would not go overboard on putting a lot of interior paddocks in, especially at the start. With this beautiful poly wire we have today and geared reels and some step-in posts, you can really fluctuate how you move those animals. It gives you so much more um, freedom to move your paddocks when you need to move them. Like in the springtime, you may want to move them fast. In the summertime, you may want to slow them up. So the more freedom you allow yourself inside that 50 acres to set that paddock size the way you need it, that's a big deal. And you need to have a way to catch them. It doesn't, don't go out and spend $10,000 on a corral. Get you some cattle panels, set some posts, maybe a, just a head catch, but you need some way to restrain that animal, especially if you're going to get into cow-calf. There's going to be a time you may want to work on one, and if you can't catch it, you can't work on it. Number, and the last one is marketing. Before we start raising this stuff, make sure you can sell it. And so if, a lot of these small farms are looking at Dexter cattle and low lines, these smaller breed cows, which is great. They're a good animal for a small farm, but make sure you can sell them. And the one thing that people forget about is call cows. You're always going to have some cows that are calls. And if you're forced to take those to the sale barn, they're going to steal them from you. You're not going to get anything for them. So make sure you can sell what you're raising. Um, you know, if you're raising what your neighbors are raising, let's just say everybody around you is raising black cows. I'm going to pick on black. And you say, oh, I'm going to get in the cattle, but I'm going to raise black cows. Well, how do you expect to get a premium? You're raising exactly what everybody else is raising, so be different. Raise a purple cow or a white one or something. Don't raise what your neighbors are doing. You've got to be different. And then get a story behind that and let people know what you're doing. People will buy from you because they want to support you. They're buying from your heart. They are. And if you get that story out there, they want to keep you in business. That's the kind of customer you want. Okay? Hey, Greg or somebody, talk a little bit more about marketing. I know John. I know where he's at. He's got the fence. He's got the water. He's got the interior fencing. He's got the corral. Marketing. Retail, yeah. what, you know. So don't, don't center your operation uh, around a sale barn. I would never do that because a sale barn, they're real good at doing one thing. They sell cattle. And they do a good job. I mean, we need sale barns. Um, but it's not a great place to get more than what everybody else is getting. How are you going to differ? You could do an excellent job of raising the best grass-fed beef in the world. But in the fall, if you take it to the sale barn, you're not going to get any more from the people that are doing it conventional-wise. So you've got to develop that market. How are you going to do that? Website. How many of you all have a website? You've got to get that website going. Then you've got to find a way to get people to go to that website. You know, we use you, YouTube has been a big, a big bonus for us. That really got people visiting our, our website a lot more. Um, you know, sell the, sell the first one to your neighbors. If you're getting into grass-fed beef, make sure you eat it before you sell it. You don't know how many people I've talked to that raise sheep. I said, well, do you like it? Well, I don't know. I've never ate one. I'm like, what? <laughs> you're raising sheep? You've never ate a sheep? Well, I wouldn't know what it even tastes like. Well, you got to eat them. You can't stand behind a product unless you know it's good. That's the other thing, you know, uh, look at trying to get as different many markets as you can. Um, I think we don't want to be a cattle farmer. We don't want to be a sheep farmer. We don't want to be a goat farmer. We want, to, we want more diversity. And the more diversity in stream, uh, streams you can have coming into your farm, the better off you are. You, you're not going to make it, not on 50 acres. 
you've got to raise something kind of special out there. So it's so like Teddy was talking this morning, South Pole females right now, heifers. You go to Silborn and buy a black heifer today. What, what are they bringing, guys? What's a weaned heifer bringing at the sale barn? Huh? 600 bucks. I'd hate to make a living doing that. You can sell them, you know, these South Pole, the good red ones. I'm talking a really functional, good female. You're talking uh, 2000 to $3,000. That's where you don't need to raise as many of them. And if you get them down to that 1,000-pound range, instead of those great big monsters... You can run more of them. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to maximize the return on that grass. I don't care what he said, only it's giving me a maximum return. And you can't do it selling to the sale barn. So don't make that your end marketing. Uh, I'm going to touch yep. on this. Uh, marketing on our farm is kind of different from a lot of farms. When we first went into business, we wanted the highest quality animal that we could get. And at that time, I was looking at carcass quality. And it didn't work out so good for me because we were dealing with those big high frame animals. And as soon as we started bringing the frame off and we got that specialty animal on the farm, how many times can you find a 1,000 pound registered black Angus cow? You know, it's kind of a specialty type thing. and. We don't advertise other than we have a website and, you know, me going out and, and talking to folks. But, you know, our, our heifers, when they leave the farm, we're getting $2,000, $2,400 for a weaned heifer. And, you know, if we we're selling bread, bread heifers, we're looking at $3,000 to $3,500. And, and it is. It's just a specialty niche. And, you know, we're sending bulls and, and, and heifers and I, I like to for me I like to sell a whole truckload of heifers versus selling pieces and parts of meat because we're very limited on labor on the farm and I was talking to a friend of mine that finishes 160 beef animals every year and I asked him how much time does it take you to market and sell one animal and he says approximately 40 hours you know, if he's selling it pieces and parts, you know, he's, he's, he's got approximately 40 hours invested in selling that animal, you know, and that's from taking it off the farm, taking it to the, the slaughterhouse, bringing it back, parting it out, pricing it, doing all, all that. So, and in, in for me, that was, it wasn't an option. But if I can sell, you know, a truckload of heifers and, or, you know, a bull and get a premium um, price for it, you know, it, it, it's really helpful. You said 41 acres? Okay. First of all, don't even think about a cow-calf operation on 41 acres because you're, you're limiting yourself right off the bat. Um, if it's 41 acres, and, and particularly if you're direct marketing, you're still limiting yourself by having a cow-calf operation there. You know, you can, you can buy in good high quality feeder calves and finish them and market those if you wanted to. Uh, you can develop heifers, you can buy in wean, wean females, you know, develop them into high quality heifers to resell. You can do seasonal so that you're not even trying to run things through the winter uh, in terms of cattle. But yeah, it, it's gonna be almost completely prohibitive on, on that amount of acreage to make any kind of really good money on a cow-calf operation, to be quite honest with you. And there, there's just no getting around that, you know, because if you were also grass finishing, I mean, first of all, if you're really, really good at what you're doing, you're, you're probably gonna have at least two acres, require at least two acres per cow, so that limits you to a 20 cow cow herd, right? At max, max, to support them year round and not have to supplement the heck out of them. Uh, but then if you're gonna go to grass finishing, now you've got weanlings, yearlings, and heavy finishers that you're maintaining along with the 20 cows, not gonna happen, not gonna happen. So you've gotta think about what other type of seasonal type cattle operation would really work well for me? Give me some pretty good cash flow through there, whether that's finishing, 
developing replacement heifers or there's like we're a large scale finisher and so we don't produce every animal that we finish and neither do the vast majority of those of us that are large scale grass finishers so we buy in a lot of we like to buy in heavy grass feeders that means eight to nine weight and so forth so there's really good markets now for developing feeder calves up to that eight to nine weight and then marketing those to grass finishers that's another option I'm, I'm going to give you a couple more things though you need cash flow throughout the year we've somehow in agriculture got caught in this trap that we believe that any one acre can only generate one revenue stream a year where did we ever come to that conclusion but that's the way the vast majority of farmers and ranchers operate today right if you grow corn on an acre, well, that's your total income for that year, and you can't do anything else on that acre. If I have a cow and a calf, I can't do anything else on that acre. Completely wrong. Chickens. For every 1,000 chickens that we run, laying hens, okay, for every 1,000 that we run, we average net profit. I'm talking net profit, not gross. Forty to $45,000, okay, for every 1,000 birds. Do you know how many you can run on 41 acres? Okay, so that, that, I hear you, but that, that's a lot more money than I can make off darn cows. Okay, even at the best, the best cows, out of the best cows, that's a lot more that I can make off of cows on a per acre basis. We average uh, about $800 net profit per finished pig. You know, so, Guys, there's a lot of other things to think about here that you can do, and you can layer those into each other, but don't get trapped into the concept or the romance of thinking, I've got to have a cow-calf operation. That we often get trapped into that and to think that's what we got to do when there's many other enterprises that will generate a whole lot more net. Another one to consider, and you know, it, it, it's going to take some management, but is hogs, because you're feeding them anyway. You can graze them, but they're they're not a ruminant, so you could have higher numbers. You need to rotate them because they can be very destructive, but that'd be another avenue. Don't like them on land that's over five percent slope. Uh, they just create. One of the coolest things you can do with hogs is they create a terrace at the bottom of the fence line so you could if you lay it out right you could move water around by the they'll build a terrace for you <laughs> it's a but that then you could dairy raw milk is one another avenue uh, you could stack the enterprises like alan's saying like my presentation with the sheep goats and cattle but it's only, it's gonna be limited. It's gonna be, you're just gonna up about 20%, maybe 30% by adding the sheep and goats. Um, the high density grazing is gonna up stocking rate by about 20%. I mean, that's a conservative number, but it'll do that. So those things are gonna take you a little ways. Um, you can also partner with, with like management you be the marketer, you raise some on your place, but you buy from others, and they have like management. You're not lying, it's, you're just a face and present, presenting what you have, so that's all I got. Based on what you guys just said about uh, the like management and um, larger operations that need these grass finished animals and a lot of people are doing that but don't necessarily you know we are sm smaller farmers and we don't necessarily have the market developed yet um, how do we get involved with people like you guys that have a bigger market yeah. more like-minded people is there some place that we well, can well this would be a good find? place right here you know uh, to visit with people that are doing this type of management Another thing to look for, look at your neighbors that have a woven wire fence and no, no goats or sheep. They'd, goats will benefit their operation. I think they all, anybody with any knowledge knows goats are good for their operation and they're not competing with the cows. So if you wanna run, if you wanna expand, that's the easiest one to expand. 
you might have to put up a high ten uh, tensile electric around it to keep them from getting there all their heads stuck and dying in the fence but but you but anyway you there is opportunities like that out there Okay, so my question is about this cow-calf operation that it seems like a lot of people in the room would like to get into. Do you guys have some pro tips when it comes to baby calves coming out about what to do or what not to do and how soon to put a tag in the ear or treat a calf and how to do that safely with that mama around? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start, Greg. Um, you know, th that's that's uh, a very controversial subject, I guess, the tagging calves and in uh, calves whenever they come out. For me, I, I go to bed at night and I'll go to the pasture and I'll have a surprise. I don't worry about it. I you know my cows and heifers whatever they need to be able to drop them calves and and take care of them i don't i don't worry about it i used to spend hours out in the pasture i do a two-hour check on cows i used to have to because i was pulling calves and it, it was just crazy it was it was it was a uh, nightmare actually but now we i go to bed at night i don't worry about it i go to the pasture in the morning and um Tagging calves, it, I'm told it, you know, you can screw up a bonding process with the mother, especially the heifers. Uh, myself, whenever I go to the pasture in the morning, I tag the calves. Being that we're registered, I have to be able to identify the calves to the cows. And I also like to, whenever I tag those calves, I like to be able to pair them to the cows. Because whenever we have people in to buy breeding stock, they want to know who the mother was, who the father was. And oftentimes, in, in the, with the cows and the calves in the herd, they kind of stay together as a family unit. I'll have mothers, grandmothers, daughters, all standing in a group whenever I'm showing these cattle to people. Um, it, it's really amazing to see. And, and, I'm not talking just cows that with fresh weaned calves. I'm talking cows that have daughters that are four or five years old, and the whole family just kind of stays together in a group. And it's for me, it's whenever we have people there, you know, we, we tag them. And as far as cows that eat you for breakfast, get rid of them. You know, if I have one that's slightly mean towards me, now if they're mean towards the dogs or uh, you know, predatory old birds. I have eagles that come in on my land and, and they clean the placentas up. It really makes my cows angry and they'll start bawling, all their tails will go up and they'll run that, physically run that eagle off the property. Uh, and, and I'm good with that because we have a coyote problem. But if I have one that's even slightly mean to me, if they paw the ground, they uh, flip their head and blow snot, <laughs> See you later. We're going to send them for hamburger. Yeah, we're the same way. You can't keep a cow that's going to try and hurt you. Uh, you know, we're in the seed stock business. That's one of our revenue streams. And, you know, we don't want to sell a calf or anything to anybody that's going to hurt somebody. You just don't want to do that. You won't be in business very long. Um, and if you keep a bull calf out of a cow like that, if you have a cow that's snotty, high-headed, Folks, just get rid of them because if you keep, let's just say that high-headed cow has a super nice bull calf. I mean, just the best one you've ever seen. And you keep it and you put him across your whole herd. Man, you really went backwards then. Now you've got a whole herd of stupid animals. They're all going to have high heads. Get rid of them. Uh, on tagging calves, we tag them on the second day. Never, ever, ever tag a calf on the first day. It's just ridiculous, I think. Because you go out there... He's right, they're bonding, and if that new mother moves off, you may have a bottle calf on your hands. So don't do that. You can catch them easily on the second day. The third day, a little, a little more challenging. They're quicker. But uh, I have a friend up North Missouri. He doesn't tag his calves until they all get done calving. He runs them up in the crowd, just the calves, and he locks them up. He'll leave them in there about three or four hours, and then he tags them, and then they'll go back out and start sucking on their moms. He'll only turn like five loose at a time. 
Um, that works if you're not moving your cattle a lot like we are. We're moving our cows twice a day, and we're moving to different farms, physically leaving a farm. Folks, you got to know which calf is out there that you just had, which goes with which mother. And if you don't account for that baby calf, you're going to leave him behind. Well, now you get to the new farm, you got a cow balling for us. Calf. You don't know which calf it is. So that's why we tag our calves. Uh, on our calving chart, we just record the, the cow number, the date she was born, or it was born, the calf, and then a, the sex, male or female, and then uh, any comments that, you know, any special conditions that might apply. If we have to handle a cow for any reason, she's gone. I don't care what it is. If we got to get her up, to help her with the calf, or she kicked at the calf, she's butting at the calf, even though she takes the calf, gone. Just not going to keep something like that. Yeah, we run a lot of cows, uh, so our average herd size on our cow herds are going to be anywhere from four to 700 cows in a herd. Uh, so we're, we are tagging so that we know who the calves are. Uh, but because they're moved every day, it's easy. It, it's not hard when you're moving cattle every day. You see everything every day. When, when they're moving from one paddock to the next, it's really, really easy to see them. It's easy to know who just calved, you know, the new calves, all of that, because they're sort of lagging behind and so forth. So that part's not a problem. Uh, I agree with Russ and Greg in that we don't put up with any cow that is going to create any kind of problem. If she's flighty, if she's snorty, anything like that, she's immediately earmarked for culling. Uh, if she has a balloon teat, you know, any other problems, we're not going to get a cow up. We're not going to strip her out. We're, we're not going to fool with them. So anything that gives us the slightest hint of a problem, they're going to be gone. Uh, the other thing that we do, we, we don't, uh, I was like Russ many, many years ago, I mean, I get up every four hours around the clock and go calf and check, especially heifers, first calf heifers. No, we don't do any of that anymore. We, we give our heifers uh, 60 days to breed and that's it, the calf is a two. I go in 30 days after pulling the bulls, I ultrasound preg check. If they're bred, they go immediately back in with the mature cow herd. We do not calf heifers out separate, okay? I, I don't do that anymore. We want absolutely as few her uh, herds as we can possibly manage. Uh, the other thing is that those that are open, we don't lose any money on them because they go into the finishing herd. And they're finished, they become meat. So we immediately make good money off of those. So the only, we do no calving assistance whatsoever. I have no clue where my calf puller and OB chains are anymore and don't care. There is no such thing on our, our operation as calving assistance. They calve and they make it, you know, as my partner and good friend Gabe Brown says, if they don't, that only happens once, right? And, you know, survival of the fittest, but it rarely happens. The vast majority of calving issues, especially abnormal presentations are caused by us. It's our fault when we put cows up especially first calf heifers and watch them and all of that. We give them, we're restricting their ability to exercise and all of that. We are the ones causing those abnormal presentations. When we've got them out on pasture moving every day and they're with the mature cows, we have a, virtually eliminated any abnormal presentations. So make this, as, my point here folks is don't make this complicated and hard. Make this as simple as you possibly can. Has, has, there's no excuse to have many, many herds. You know, we used to teach that, at, and universities and extensions still teach that. It's wrong. I mean, I'm just going to say it flat out, okay? And I'll challenge anybody on that. They can debate me on that, but it's wrong. You have far fewer problems, far fewer issues, and you make far more money by having as few herds, combining those herds, so we have a main mob herd, what we call a main mob herd, that's cows, calves, weanlings, yearlings, everything all together. Then once those yearlings reach eight to nine weight, and typically more like nine weight, then we peel them out of that main mob, and we do have a separate finishing herd, but that's a large herd, okay? But they don't go into that herd till they're at least 800 pounds. 
And then they're there from that point forward. And most of the time we're doing with those, we're doing a leader follower. So we are running the finishers first and they're only allowed to take like the top 20% and that's it. And then the main mob of everything else combined is following them. And, and that works pretty well. I agree with everything said, um, and we don't want the high heads either. You know, those ears go up, that's a sign. You're on the edge of the flight zone, and if they're high-headed, you just get rid of them. As far as uh, tagging the calves or cutting the calves, we, we're, like Greg said, in the second scenario, we'll just wait until they go through a corral, and we'll tag them at that time and match them up later. If you are uh, castrating and tagging in the field, usually that's a two-man operation. Is, are you doing it, everybody? Two-man for calving or, or, yeah, castrating or? Okay, but tagging, do you use two people? Or, yeah, and keep the calf between the, the if, if I was the cow, the calf needs to be here. You don't, you, and then the person over there. You don't want, you want that mother to have to cross her calf to get to you. I wouldn't want to be here and her behind me. That's not a good situation. Uh, one other thing I want to cover, um, we have found that when we go out to move our cows each day in calving season, you don't go out there and grab that reel and roll it up. That m new mother is standing by that calf. You've got a big herd, let's say you know, we're running three to 400 animals, you just automatically go grab that reel and to roll it up to give them the new paddock. They're going to move. And that new mother, she may be, it's a powerful force not to move with that new mom. But she's got a baby back there. You know, just take five minutes, walk through your herd, find out where the babies are, and write down the calf tag or the cow tag number that calved, and then open the wire. Otherwise, you may spend 30 minutes out figuring out, no, wait a minute, I wonder... I wonder if that calf sucked or who the mother is. No, just identify that. And don't put up a back fence. Leave the gate open. If you put that gate shut and you just moved your cows into a new paddock, how do you know she doesn't have one hit on the back side of that paddock? You don't. And it's going to be back in the brush and some tall stuff. That's where they lay. You're not going to find it. Leave the gate open. She can go back and get it. But if you close that gate, that calf goes 12 hours out sucking. You don't want that, not on a newborn calf. Get them all to stand up before you move. Go through the four wheeler or whatever, get all the calves and sheep, lay them standing up. Then you can move them to the gate. Mr. Greg Judy, you mentioned earlier about the cockabers being uh, having a canopy you know, grown up over them. Exactly how long does it take for the cockabers and perilla mint to be choked out by that canopy? How long does it take? Um, well, in the springtime, you get your spring flush of grass. Now I'm talking about central Missouri. The burr starts to germinate about the last week of uh, May. By June 1st, he's up. And so we can start grazing usually around the 7th of April. We're grazing. We've got you know, seven, eight inches of grass. We're just tipping. And so basically from, let's say, uh, the first week of April until uh, June 1st, so that'd be, what is that? About six to seven weeks. That stuff needs to get up there tall and thick to shade out that burr seed. Because if it gets sunlight, it's gonna come busting up through there. And now you've got a whole nother crop and a whole nother year. Because guys, ladies, you can brush hog those things down. It's going to come screaming right back. You just got to keep it from germinating. And the only way to do that is to act like you don't own it in the springtime. Re regarding pigs, you mentioned whether you run them with the cattle or have them separately, the damage that they can do. Of any experience with the Idaho pasture pig or Cooney Coonies, I mean, I, I've only read about these, but apparently shorter snout, they don't root as much. Do you have any experience with those? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, I, I've run them with, with the cow herd, but it was small numbers. There was only like five pigs. And if they don't root very much until they get about 150 pounds, I'm just talking about pigs in general. 
Uh, after 150, they can tear up the world, especially if, if it's rainy, if it's wet, and vegetation's low. If you've got high vegetation, they don't tear up that much. Yeah, I've got a, a friend up in north of Missouri. He runs the Cooney Cooney, and he's right. When they get a little size on them, he'll put a ring in their nose. That just stops all the rooting. If you don't ring them, those little boogers can make and flat turn some sod over, especially in the springtime when it's wet. I mean, it's easy. They're going after the worms and the roots and the tubers. That's what they do. I mean, that's, that's a tool, and they're going to use it. And Leslie, you mentioned don't run pigs on more than a 5% grade. I not heard. I knew it. I think you mentioned he, earlier, don't run pigs on more than a 5% slope. It's just due to conservation and erosion. Yeah. Now, if they're not there, if you're rotating every day, you're just not going to have that big issue. You could go on steeper slopes, but most people are not rotating daily. They're, most people are there for a week or even longer. Um, and if, you're, if they're tearing up the world, every field you go to, I understand staying longer in one location. So, but that's more of a, I like a three-day rotation. They tear up a little bit, but again, if it hadn't rained, they don't tear up that much, so. And we're, pigs are excellent foragers. Okay? If you remember that video I showed a little earlier, they love to go out into fresh forage, particularly high forage, and they'll just start chowing down like a darn cow will, or a sheep or whatever. So it, it's all about that movement. Uh, you know, Greg said it in that regard. It, the more frequently you move them, the less rooting you're going to have because they're going to pay more attention to what, you know, the forage and those types of things. And the other thing that we have found is the more diversity that there is in that forage, particularly if you got some, a really good population of forbs out there, they're going to do a lot more foraging than they are rooting. And you, you control that rooting by the, the frequency of movement we move ours anywhere from every day to typically every two days and we watch basically we base that on the rooting behavior if they're rooting a little more we'll go to every day instead of every two days but for us it's all behind a single strand of poly wire put about a foot off the ground they are very very averse to electricity because of that wet snout and once they touch it I, we can lay it down on the ground. They will not step across it. Okay? You either have to lift it or you have to reel it up before they'll move forward. But they, even if you lay it on the ground, they see it and they will flat out not step across it. We also have a lot of feral pigs, wild pigs in our area, but they are also electric, electric, electric fence averse. So they do not get in and mix in with our pastured pigs at all. We don't have any problems with that. I switch to the 14 gauge wire because it carries electricity better and they don't tear it up as bad. I had some trouble with poly wire might be that I didn't have it quite hot enough, but um, it, that works a little better. Yeah, the, the pigs are, they're very rewarding and like I say, move them about every three days would be ideal, be my ideal. Move them before the rain if, if possible. Just uh, wondering if any of you guys have any advice on managing goats on a large, rough mountain property without fencing the whole thing with a uh, really good perimeter fence, uh, such as with herders or bringing them in every night. I'm talking 4,000 acres with 500 to 800 acres of overgrown pasture on it. If you have a good perimeter, just turn them loose and let them go for the browse. The question is, is uh, how, it's a big property and he's got lots of brush and it's steep and how do you fence the goats? And I, I would just, I'd let them go for it because I don't think they're gonna compete with the cattle hardly at all if you're stocked right. If they've got browse, they're not gonna eat grass. Um, so I'd just get the perimeter right. It might be one hot wire eight inches off the ground on whatever fence you've got now. They won't cross water. 
if it's any size to it. Um, I don't know. That's about all I got on that. Yeah, we had a friend that had uh, 3,500 goats, and he, w he, he was giving them 80-acre paddocks. And those paddocks, they were hard-fenced, uh, but he, he still had to put an offset wire in there. Those goats were going after the brush, and uh, they weren't, but like Greg said, that's all they were eating was the brush. They weren't touching the grass. And so that's, that's the way he ran was on 80-acre paddocks. He did rotate. He seemed like he got a lot better consumption on the brush by tightening up a little bit. But, uh, yeah, that's a lot of goats. Okay. Yeah, I talked to Russ a little bit about, and I, was, I appreciated him mentioning the shade, but I was wanting to pick y'all's brain in the even further south. As um, I, I get worried, I'm, I'm good in spring and fall. In the middle of summer, I'm always worried and trying to fence back to get the shade so the issue was uh, you, you're a little bit worried about shade and extreme temperatures of the summertime what do you do about that are you talking about cattle sheep or everything no it's cattle and cattle yeah. Um, yeah so a lot of people believe that shade is a real issue and you know when it, the humidity in Missouri I mean, we get you know 80 90 percent humidity and it's 100 degrees I want to make sure my animals have shade and so if I don't have any shade in that particular paddock, I'll make sure they can, they can walk back for some trees. I'm going to lose a little bit of fertilizer under those trees, but I know my animals are going to be comfortable. If, you can't, if your animals are stressed and they can't cool down, you're, you're not making any money. And they actually can lose weight during that period. They only graze in the dark because it's so miserable out. I don't want them standing in the ponds. You know, we don't let them in the ponds, first of all, but... Uh, Joel Salton, you know, he's got the, the shade mobiles. Uh, we were there last week and right up on the hill. It was pretty hot that day. He parked that out on the open hill, and that night he had about 100 steers on there, about 900 pounds, maybe 1,000. And, I mean, you, it was unbelievable. It was just a big old black spot. And he said that spot will stay there for three years. It'll be greener. The plants will be thicker and more lush right where he parked that dude at. So it is a great tool, if you, and he uses uh, old mobile homes or hay racks, uh, both, you know, but he's got three of them that he hooks together. He can get 100 head under there, under three of them, and he can pull them with this side by side. We're in sure enough hot country where I'm at, you know, so, uh, and we also deal with that humidity. So our temperature humidity index is really what gets us. And oftentimes we can have heat index days ranging between 120 and 130. And the problem is, is at night it doesn't get better. You know, you go further north, y'all cool down at night, you know, and y'all, even you do where you are, Greg, y'all, and, and, and you do too. Yeah, but we're so far south, that doesn't happen as a matter of fact. It can feel more oppressive in the evenings at midnight because the humid, even though our temperature drops a little, <laughs> not very much, but the humidity goes up, right? Yeah, so you are you go out at midnight and you're dripping sweat, okay? So there's multiple strategies here. One certainly is genetic and epigenetic selection within your livestock. My goodness, you, you know, Teddy this morning, talked about wanting cattle to really slick off, right? And, and Greg, I know you're huge on that, you know, but uh, we are at, that's absolutely vital for us. If cattle do not slick out super slick by early April, we don't want them in our genetics, okay? They better, they better absolutely be super slick and, and holding on to no hair at all. That's one thing that's really critical, and that's both genetic and epigenetic. Okay, but the second is natural shade. Now we have both natural and artificial shade and I'll talk about the artificial in a minute. But natural always trumps any artificial period. You just can't beat it. If you walk into it, you can automatically tell the difference when you walk into the woods and things like that. So one of the problems that many people have is that they've gone in and took out a lot of their trees. You know, they didn't think about saving shade. You need to save shade and shade corridors. 
you can lean to shade as much as you can get to natural shade, get to natural shade. We do have a lot of woodland, and so we do woodland grazing, and we purposefully stockpile and save that for the worst months of the summer for us, which are July and August and go into September. That's our worst month. So we purposefully stockpile within our silvopasture areas so that we can utilize those at that point. We are grass finishing 365 days a year and harvesting you know, every week. And so we can't have these dips in production in our finishers, even in the heat of the summer like that. So we've got to use these strategies. So we also have shade havens, uh, but the truth is now we use those mostly for our chickens. Uh, but they work outstanding for them. But we use those structures as well. I think we got five or six of them, something like that. Um, but another strategy that we cannot overlook, folks, is this. If you keep, if you graze too short, you remember the pictures I showed you this morning with the temperatures, soil temperatures, okay? And when you had short cropped pastures or fields or whatever, where was that temp? way over 100 degrees, right? So think about this. If your cattle are having to stand on pastures that are 110, 120, 130 degrees, how comfortable do you think they're going to be? They're going to be begging for shade and begging for water, right? But if they're in deep, lush pasture, even on the hottest day, if you shoot the temp down there at the soil surface on that, or if you even stick your hands down there, it's in the 70s or low 80s, okay? That creates radiant cooling in these animals. They're basically in their bare feet. So as they're walking through those pastures, and if you're creating a cool, moist environment on their, quote, bare feet, that creates capillary cooling, just like a radiator works. It creates capillary cooling, and their whole body is much cooler. And what our animals will do in the heat of the day, they'll graze and then rather than go shading up, even on a 120 degree heat index day, they'll lay down right there in the middle of the pasture. Why? Because they're putting a lot more of their body surface, skin surface in contact with that cool moist soil. So you're getting really, really good capillary cooling. And there is a definitive cool zone we have measured this over and over. You can, you can measure temperature from right down here, up, 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 and you'll find how far up that cool zone comes. And the further up that cool zone comes, the more comfortable your livestock are gonna be. So that's a multiplicity of strategies. If you combine all of those, it works very well. Anybody else? I, I may have been a little misleading this morning about shade. Uh, we do, when, whenever we're grazing, my farm is pretty much all open. You've seen that. And there is a few tree sections. When we're grazing across those areas, we'll skip them. And then if we have a time whenever the, the temperatures are going to be high, we'll actually physically move them back, but we'll only move them in there for a short period of time. Because ultimately, I want them out there grazing. So I may bring them back to that shade for from like one o'clock to 3.30, and then I'll physically move them back out into shade whenever the temperatures start dropping again. And another thing that we do that really helps, and we, we work off heat index, the heat index on a cow is 84 degrees before they really start showing signs of stress. And, and that increases, and the, the way you can tell that they're stressed is count their breaths per minute. If you get above 100 breaths per minute, um, you're, you need to get back to shade. And, and it's, it's easy, you just go out and count how many breaths you have for six seconds and times it by 10. You know, you don't have to count it for an entire minute. Just count the breasts for six seconds, count times it by 10, and you have your breasts per minute. And another thing that we're doing uh, are water. We'll water 110 animal units out of a half of a 55-gallon drum, and we'll only put 10 gallons of water in it, 
And that water is cycling through that tank all the time. Whenever you have that, uh, that high number of animals, it's cycling through. And whenever it comes out of the ground, it's 55 degrees because of the geothermal. And it, you know, if you're running a 400 foot garden hose, it's gonna be warm. But if you can keep that stock tank back close to your hydrant, um, your water's gonna be cooler. And you know, you're not gonna be drinking coffee on a 100 degree day, you'd rather have have iced tea and you're less likely to get heat stressed. Yeah, I do things real similar to what they're talking about. The heat humidity index, the index that I use is by the Noble Foundation. Pretty much what it shows is 80 degrees, 80% 80 humidity. You need shade above that. That may be a little bit on the low side. You know, it probably push you a little bit, but also another thing, they'll consume, if they don't have shade, they'll consume twice the water. So I, I provide alternative water. I'll have another trough that they can consume more water on. And I'm doing that more and more, even in cooler times, just provide more water. It's the most important nutrient. Uh, so I think that's important. The civil pasture is something, especially where you need shade. That's something I think all of us are working with and it, it's got application even if you have existing trees or if you want to plant trees. People say, well, it takes too long. Well, if you don't start, you're never going to get there. And, you know, it's going to be needed long term by somebody. And really, it doesn't take that long. Seven years, you'll get a little shade. Uh, you can plant some fast species along with some slower species like oaks but plant a few tulip poplar in this area along with some oaks and you'll have shade in a reasonable time, like I say, seven years. If you're managing uh, a woods and you're clearing out some existing woods to grow grass, you need to have at least 50% light get to the ground, 80 foot or further between groups of trees or even single trees. Most civil pastures don't have enough light to the ground to grow grass. They, they're still just a woods that's open. So I think those are the main points I wanted to hit. Uh, one that I think I would add, if you're just starting out and you're selecting your, your cattle and you're in a heated, you're going to have a lot of heat, I, I wouldn't go with black. You know, I'm going to pick on black. Uh, you go with red or, or white or something, but just you know, Gerald Fry always talked about that. Remember Alan that? He was always saying if you, you know, they, they did a, I think it was in Gillette, Wyoming. You heard the study, I believe, where they put a surface thermometer on a black hided animal and a red hided animal. And the ambient temperature that day was like 105. And they went out and measured the animals at like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, the red hided animal was like 108, 110. And the black one was 138. So, you know, that's a big difference. And so that animal's gonna suffer more. Um, if you're up in north, though, maybe you'd want a black kind of animal. You need a little more, you know, heat in the wintertime. But, well, if you're down south, you know, you're running black cattle, they're gonna heat up. Yeah, to, to your point, that's exactly correct. And so we've got a lot of South Pole and South Pole Red Angus Cross, and we also have Piney Woods. South Piney Woods and South Pole and Piney Woods and Red Angus Cross. And you saw from my videos, we also still have some blacks, okay? But I will tell you point blank, in our summers, you can absolutely tell who is who. Because as soon as it starts heating up in the daytime, particularly in the afternoon, those Piney Woods crosses, those South Pole crosses, they are still out there grazing in the bald sun. And every single animal that is black hided is trying to shade up somewhere they are hunting shade so it they definitely divide themselves you can see it very quick that should be an absolute culling point for you i got one more thing on the shade Dior. is red clover dilates the blood vessels and makes circulation better so that can help a little bit too I've heard you speak of culling several times and we're grass finishing our beef. We're doing it for 365 days a year. Is there a market for an older animal that is a cow calf operation that maybe have a three or four year old mama cow and she's got her head up? What do you do? 
we never sell an animal at a sale barn. Uh, every animal that we cull, we turn into meat. So that's a cull cow, anything. Why in the world would I sell a cull, cull cow for four and five, four or five hundred dollars, when if I turn her into hamburger, that girl is a twenty-five hundred to three thousand dollar individual for me. So every animal that we have, you know, it, it, when they're culled, they they go into meat, and you know we always have a call for hamburger. But to speak to that on a larger scale. There are growing opportunities in that regard for cull cows. There are companies right now, now if they're grass-fed qualified, okay, so let me, let me qualify my statement by saying that. So if these cull cows are grass-fed qualified, there are rapidly growing and emerging markets that are, that are trying to find as many of those as they can find and aggregate them and put them together. So there are opportunities that are that are rapidly developing that you can take advantage of and and if we can get enough of you together we can get your calls aggregated get them on a truck we need to ship them and load lots but those opportunities are there now anybody else yeah, we pretty much do the same as alan does we don't sell anything at the sale barn either um, our call cows they just become hamburger yeah, there's a, a guy, uh, he's got a business, that's what he does, but you got to put together a load of them. He won't, he's not going to buy two from you. You're going to have to get at least a, a gooseneck trailer load, but, you know, Bill Roberts, so he's been doing it for years, but they got to be grass-fed. Can't feed them any grain. You, know, you can't be, you know, feeding them antibiotics, no growth hormones. They got to be what he calls all natural. But it seems like Bill's always pleading for these type cows. He, he, needs, he needs more of those. I'm going to take that question back to the fellow with a small acreage, and Alan kind of alluded to it, but these heifers that didn't breed, they're a real opportunity. They, they're culls for the commercial guy. They're value added. They've taken the animals to a weight where they're ready to finish. We're already finished. So you could just buy those. If you're a small farm, just bring those in. You'll get with somebody that has 200 or more cows and buy all their coals. You'll, that would be a good way to stock and sell meat. So to Greg's point, you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, for those of us that are large scale grass finishers, if we could, if I could, a hundred percent of what I grass finish would be heifers. I wouldn't finish a single darn steer if I could get away with that, okay? I'd sell all my steers to somebody else, let them finish them. I'd sell them as feeders, and I would finish only heifers. Why? They finish quicker, they finish easier, they're more tender, and they're going to marble better than their steer mates all the time, okay? So I love heifers, so you're exactly right. Us grass finishers are hunting those kinds of animals, and so those heifers that fail to breed for the first time that are, you know, 15, 16, 17 months or whatever, they're perfect candidates. And then the first calf heifer, if you bred her to calf first as a two, that first calf heifer that fails to rebreed, she's still under 30 months. She still makes it under that 30 month roll, rule. And guess what? I can finish her in a very short period of time, and because she's also got some age and maturity on her, she's gonna marble real quick, and marble, she'll always grade choice, okay? So we love those kind of cattle, so you're 100% you're correct on that. Okay, we're gonna cut it off right there. Great panel discussion, guys. Pre appreciate it very much. Good job. <laughs>